This is a really important session, and it links beautifully with this morning's. Anyone was with Dan Hamelin? What did he say? AI is the number one trend for 2016. Plenty of other sessions talk about personalized, just for you, just in time learning, and is onto that as well. So th this session is on the button, and I'm going to say very little. I don't need really to introduce Donald. I say uh, I will introduce Donald, and I will introduce Andy, but I don't need to say very much. Donald is a mercurial figure that if anyone in this room has not heard of Donald Clark, where have you been? <laughs> he's all over everything. And he, he's all over everything with strong views, really sharp insights, and an eye for what's going on in the future, and an even bigger eye for bullshit. So he, he plays it straight, and who would have him any other way? So Donald. The floor is yours, and you and your brain are, yeah. are on. <laughs> I have a prop. Good afternoon. You know, I, was, I came, came out, I wasn't here yesterday, and I missed the keynote, unfortunately, great AI. And I went, I had a little dabble around the conference. And you know that horrible sinking feeling when somebody on a stand takes you on and said, can I show you my e-learning program? And you're there 15 minutes later, and you want to die a death with boredom. <laughs> if you've not experienced that, then I don't know what conference you've been at. It must have been another one. But really, there is a massive disjunct, I think, between what's happening out there in terms of e-learning content and what these things really want. We've all got one of these. They're neural networks. It's the most sophisticated thing in the universe that we know of. And what do we feed it? We feed it linear, dull, text graphic, text graphic, multiple choice question stuff. And what does this thing do? It shuts down, <laughs> you know, really. We've all been there, we're probably making the stuff. I've made it, I've sold it. But is there a way out of this trap? Is there another paradigm coming along here? Because I think there is. And it's almost invisible, but it's there. And this is a massive gear shift in technology, but more importantly, it's a massive gear shift in terms of what we can do with this thing here. And let me explain, okay? We don't remember things like videotapes, just recording them in a linear fashion. We don't remember things alphabetically or hierarchically. This is a network. It's a personal brain. You come with a different set of expectations, educational background, biases, accents, gender, hundreds of things. And when you get this flat linear e-learning, it's like wearing a suit that's about three sizes too small for you. You just feel totally constrained by this stuff. It doesn't sort of make sense to you. And you labor through it, and you learn from it. I don't want to diss this stuff, because some of it does the job. But can it do the job better? So that's going to be my focus, really. I'm talking about AI, but really I'm talking about learning and the brain. And don't think that AI is about copying the brain. There's a big AI fallacy, as people in AI would call it. Remember that we didn't learn to fly by mimicking the flapping of birds' wings. That's not how it happened. We invented fantastic technology that flies hundreds of us across the Atlantic very safely by inventing a new form of technology that does it better than birds. We didn't learn to go fast by copying the bones of a cheetah's leg. We invented the wheel. And AI is not about mimicking the brain or reinventing the brain. It's about all sorts of, there's a huge range of, sort of mathematical techniques here that help us do things that human beings do, teaching, training, learning, okay? And one of the reasons that it has been around for a long time, why now? Why has it suddenly exploded? Why is every major technical company in the world spending hundreds of millions, if not billions, on acquiring AI companies? Because the web feeds the AI rocket with data. We had AI before. Why didn't it work? It was too expensive. It didn't have enough data feed. We now have this tsunami of data coming from the web that allows AI to flourish and we can really have practical applications at work. And of course, none of this is new. Uh, Euclid came up with the first algorithm uh, in his book on geometry. We have Aristotle with a whole load of syllogistic stuff. al Khwarizmi, the great Arab scholar who gave us the word algorithm. We are in the age of algorithms. Right through to Boulle, Frege, Pascal, Fermat, right down to the base here, if you've ever done 101 uh, machine learning courses and so on, probability, you'll know Bayes, who was an English pastor. This is two and a half thousand years of thinking that's gone into AI. It's not a flash in the pan thing. It's about hardcore maths, okay? Now, I'm gonna talk about AI and learning. You had that stuff from the guy this morning talking generally about how you can use it in the, the broader world, but what does it mean for us in this room? We're learning professionals. How can we apply this stuff 
in the world that we know. And I've got a sort of taxonomy, because it's not simple. There's loads of different types of AI here. I've got a taxonomy here, which is level through these levels. And I'll work through this, giving you lots of examples on the, sh on the road, OK? The first one is tech. Every single person, every one of these devices here, uses AI all the time because there are about nine or 10 algorithms that really did change the world. One is around file compression and decompression. There's encryption. Every time you press a button on your phone or your personal assistant, there's an AI machine behind it all helping you. If you use Google, that's absolutely nothing but AI. Google is a search and ad company. It makes all its revenue from a bundle of algorithms. That's it. End of story. So you're already massively immersed in this thing. Another big fallacy that uh, you know, it's going to murder us, it's going to grab our steak knives in the kitchen and sneak up on us while we're in our beds at night and murder us. Forget the dystopian view. That's not coming to us any time soon. We're way below that level. That's the confused autonomy with artificial intelligence. The two things are completely separate. So don't be worrying your head about the Hollywood vision on this one. So what have all these guys got in common over the last week or two even? They are spending unbelievable sums of money on AI and machine learning companies. This week, even Apple, who are nowhere near this, bought a company called LearnSprout. Learning company, analytics, machine learning, AI-driven company, Amazon, have their machine, Amazon machine, you, you, you know that they do loads of hosting, they now have an on-tap artificial intelligence service, a machine learning service, Facebook, also massive department devoted to this, acquiring almost on a weekly basis. Google's whole alphabet structure is strategically based around the AI. IBM and Watson, that is an AI thing that you just turn the tap on and buy it by the pound. Uh, Microsoft, similar stuff, machine learning, Cisco, Oracle, they're all at it. They're all at it, and for a good reason, and that is because it is the future of IT. Okay, I've said Google. This was the page rank algorithm which made Google what it is. They no longer use this, so it's an amended form, but basically this is the sort of stuff that's happening, which you have been using all the time, almost unaware of the fact that you're using it, but that's what it is. It's maths. Okay? And it's not just in Google. If you don't think you're subjected to the age of algorithm stuff, then if you've been involved in online dating, if you go and see the football, Man City have 13 data analysts. If you buy a book on Amazon, if you use Netflix, use Facebook, there's a huge amount of algorithmic power behind the scenes that is subtly guiding your behavior. I don't think this is a bad thing necessarily. There are downsides to this, which we can discuss later. But I think ultimately it's just trying to get you to buy the right book, find the right partner or in a football team's case, win the league. Interestingly, Leicester have no data analysts, so that may, <laughs> that may be a good counterexample in England. Uh, and all this tech that we're seeing, I've been heavily involved in this over the last couple of years, this thing here costs about 10 bucks to make. This is all about smart software, all about smart algorithms that lock the movement of the head in a 3D model, and that's going to explode in the world soon as well. Similarly with AR, I don't know if you've seen this thing, basically, Absolutely astonishing. You know, you, you, this company here just raised nearly a billion dollars at a valuation of 4.5 billion, and they don't have a single customer. Not a single customer. How can somebody raise that sum of money? Because you will wear their technology and it will seamlessly blend that whale in the gym for your school kids in the school. It's that good. That's some amazing things starting to happen here. This is all AI based underneath the hood, as it were. Some interesting things before I come to real applications here. Uh, just in December, there was a guy, I saw a guy giving a talk, Professor AI from Australia, and just that day, this team in Tokyo had got their AI engine to pass the university exam for the university. It passed the university exam for the uh, Japanese universities. Not only that, it did it well above the average, 53.8%. And this is maths, history, all sorts of subjects. Why was this such a massive breakthrough? Because if a piece of AI can do what a graduate can do, think about all the jobs that graduates do that could be done in the future through AI. If this is true, it can easily pass that exam. Why can't it do loads of other things? Interesting question. Where is this going? And it's not just one thing here. There's semantic analysis so that it understands the question. There's a huge amount of stuff in the middle here, understanding possible solutions. In fact, it, it almost operates like a very smart adaptive feedback reinforcement loop that teachers would understand. Formulations, calculations, extremely complicated, but it got there. 
Another amazing thing from Chris Peachy's team, big, big AI team in Stanford, is they took 1.4 million answers from Can Academy, tracked what these kids actually did as they went through mathematics and using Can, and they are now up to 85, this is an astonishing figure, 85% of the time they can predict what that kid will do in the next question. What they will get wrong, what they will get right, 85% of the time they get it spot on. So that AI engine does what a really good teacher probably can never do, I've taught maths. Believe me, if you've got 30 kids in front of you, you're teaching them maths, you have no idea what's going on in their head, none. And the idea that you could, a teacher could predict 85% of the time what the kid's gonna do next, it will never happen. So we have an example here of, in a sense, the technology transcending some teacher skills better than a teacher, not at everything, motivation and so on, we have to be careful with this, but it's starting to happen, okay? The, why does this matter? Well, I think this whole, it, you know, it's more diagnostic than a teacher. It can predict and therefore help students get to the level, uh, right level whenever they want here. The idea that you are presenting content not in a linear fashion, as I explained earlier, but in a clever, smart, personalized, adaptive fashion that suits just you because you have that problem. Maths is incredibly difficult to teach. And even if you're teaching two, six plus two, to infants, there, you know, there's 20 different ways kids can get that wrong. So, you know, a lot of kids go one, two, and then they go one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, that, that, that. and loads of kids do that. They start with the smallest number, and you can teach them one thing. You say, well, start with six, and just go six, one, two, and that's eight. That's called the min strategy. In other words, that's a little algorithm that you can teach kids to immediately increase their mathematics scores, because the brain is an algorithmic machine, and mathematics is about learning those little algorithms even when you do mental arithmetic, which is why the present government don't know a damn thing about maths and getting kids to recite their times tables is a fucking stupid idea. <laughs> it really is. You should be teaching them how to calculate, not just simply rote learning. Some rote learning is okay. Another interesting thing here is Go, uh, the famous game that came out as a Buddhist tradition in, in the Far East and Google have just beaten the European champion in Go. This was a great, like, there's a competition held every year to see who can beat Go. It's an incredibly difficult game, much more sophisticated than chess. And DeepMind, London-based company, bought by Google for half a billion, suddenly beats the European champion at Go. Nobody expected this, nobody. And what they do is they train the software using good Go champions. Then they just stick a camera in front of the game, it can be any game, it learns the game and it beats the champion. Again, what's the lesson here? It's trained on human, real human behavior, you remember. That's how this thing starts to work. It plays itself, so you get go, the AI algorithm actually just creates another model and starts playing itself millions and millions and millions of times until it comes to a conclusion. Out pops at the end this huge amount of processing power that Google have. This is why the vendors out here have to be careful to do this properly. You need an immense amount of processing power, which hardly any of those people possess, but the top five, six companies in the world do. Okay, and it matters because we're moving from theory to practice. We're seeing real practical applications, whether it be self-driving cars, there's a good model there for us here. Could we have completely self-driven learning here? I think we will. Huge breakthrough because this will increasingly deliver good teaching and learning. That's my proposition here, and I think it will happen. It already is. If you don't use Google, where have you been? You're already doing this stuff, okay? Now, the idea that, this is the famous quote you see at every educational conference, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers by Thomas Watson from IBM. Of course, he never said that. Like most educational quotes, especially those from Einstein, he never actually said this. It's absolute bullshit. Never mind, he had a point. Because actually, it's turned out to be almost true. <laughs> you know, there may be just five companies who control the whole of this in terms of the processing power and of course the cloud phenomenon that we're seeing from all of them. And you can go and buy this stuff like a tap. You can go to Watson and literally turn on machine intelligence and buy it and use it in an application you want. And I've been using this stuff myself. I'll come to that now. Let's think about some real stuff here for a minute. That was tech, okay? It's deeply embedded in technology. Here's some assistive stuff that's coming along. Uh, about a few years ago, I was given a talk uh, like this and chairing Jimmy Wells. And at the end, I asked them a question. I said, you know, this Wikipedia stuff, it's okay, but when I teach kids, 
You know, they just cut and paste this stuff. You know, it's not good enough for learning. Have you ever thought of making Wikipedia a really active learning thing? He said, that is a great idea, but honestly, I have no money. I only have 20 staff and I've got 200 languages. I don't have the time. I thought, right, okay, I'll go off and try something on this front, which I did. And then my, my holy grail, I spent 30 years, years running an e-learning company. It's now called Leo, what's called it. I, I started that company and, and ran it for years. I spent all my time creating e-learning content and it was a really painful task. Subject matter experts, interactive designers, months on end, 15 to 20 grand an hour, and everybody comes out a bit whacked at the end. <laughs> that's what it's like, guys. You've all been there. And that, that's good. Good stuff. Good companies. Good people doing good things. But imagine a world where you don't have to do that. Imagine you just give me a PowerPoint, a video, a text document, you name it, and I just put it into the system. I press a button, and it automatically creates e-learning because it's got an artificial engine behind it. A semantic engine. Imagine the world where actually most of those companies would just disappear overnight if this is true. But it's starting to happen because intelligent semantic engines can actually do this. So can you actually just press a button and can artificial intelligence create e-learning? I think it can. And we have this product called Wildfire and it takes a document, a PowerPoint and a video. So the semantic engine takes that stuff, it looks at it and goes, what's the most meaningful concepts here? Then it creates a whole lot of interactivity around that, whether it be mostly, I think, automaticity. You mostly have to type stuff in there, you know, fill in the blank type questions, which I, I'm not a big fan of multiple choice. Recognition from a list is not what a doctor or a nurse needs on a ward. Is this your lung? Is it your heart? I'm not quite sure. I'll have a guess at C, because that's the longest answer. No, you need to be able to recall knowledge. So that thing's based around this. It'll do loads of different things. Not only that, it will create, if you're, we did this with some clinical guidelines uh, recently, some nice guidelines in healthcare. If you're a care worker and you're reading the difference between a virus and a bacterium and infection in children, you might not actually know what the difference is between a, a virus and bacteria. You, know, you might not really have come across that. It actually creates automatically Wikipedia links that take you out to the Wikipedia page on a virus. It shows you a picture of a virus, explains why it's different from a bacterium. Not only that, it grabs the Wikipedia page and creates e-learning from that as well. Makes it an active learning experience. So suddenly we have something that does what I never thought would be possible. No, this is just a straight text document from a US history course that I got doing in Arizona State University. The academic only had documents. So we put the document in, and when you come across like, up here, Major Stephen Harrison, his last name is Long. The semantic engine knows that it wants the surname. You have to type the word Long in. It's a waste of time knowing that Abraham Lincoln's first name was Abraham. It's a wee bit more important to know that it was called Lincoln. So it will intelligently pick this stuff up, create a link, you didn't type it incorrectly, and it will go off to Wikipedia, automatically pluck out a Creative Commons image and create e-learning around him as well. And on it goes. Give me a video, I'll work with a video, so on and so forth. So suddenly, AI, in a, in a blink of an eye, really, can reduce the cost from 15 to 20 grand an hour to almost zero. You would have no upfront production costs because you just put the document in and it works. And no maintenance because if you've got a compliance document, for example, just give me the new document and it works on real time anyway. It will just use that new document. You don't have to worry about creating new e-learning so there's no maintenance costs either, okay? Other things that are coming along, Online assessment, remember we're in assistive mode, how can AI help us here? If you've ever been involved in MOOCs and online assessment or proctoring, a big problem is identifying who you are at the other end of this process. But of course we now have, this is a really interesting one, it's a company called Smool who do this. They will do facial recognition on you, not only at the beginning for authentication against your passport, it will do it in real time while you're doing the exam because you can actually spot whether people are sort of cheating and look over the top just through facial movements, that's interesting. Other things, you know, the, the typing algorithm that people have, uh, Proctor, you use this. So at the beginning on a Coursera course, you type in a few words, it knows exactly who you are from that unique fingerprint and the way you type things. Authentication, that's AI, folks. Other things coming along, facial recognition, iris. This is interesting, vein recognition even. So there are lots of ways we can identify people, another application of AI. Automated essay marking. This is something you may have seen on Facebook a lot. If only I had a few more papers to grade, said no teacher ever. Teachers I know hate marking. Whether they're university lecturers, primary school teachers, or secondary school, they hate it with a vengeance. And if you're ever at a dinner party with a teacher, they will tell you they hate it. And will they do anything about it? No, they won't. 
they seem to be sadomasochists. They want to get kids in universities to endlessly write essays and then wait three weeks till they get the results back. But we must move to a situation, if teachers want that workload taken off their shoulders, they have to look at automating it. And it is possible. You train these essay marking systems up by real essay markers, and then they do the job for you. And of course, it's not all about marking. The student then can submit a first draft of an essay, see if it works or not. You know, that formative build around essay writing, which is what it's really about, is now possible. Let's look at the analytics side here then. Now, you, this is about doing, grabbing stuff about learners. Let's suppose I grab data about all you people in this room at the beginning. And I use that data intelligently using algorithms to decide what I'm going to do with you in learning terms. Now, I could gather information about your learning styles, but that would be a complete waste of time because they don't exist. <laughs> And that would be a complete and utter waste of money, but we will probably end up doing This is like really crap learning ideas hitting technology, and there are a few people who have been doing this, believe me, and it's a disaster. And you say, oh, we'll have it Myers-Briggs, we'll use that, don't we? Well, that's bullshit as well, I'm afraid. <laughs> There's absolutely no scientific validation of Myers-Briggs. The two women here, Myers and Briggs, weren't psychologists. They plucked the wrong bit, actually out of the world of Jungian psychology. And of course, this exists in your organization because it's a Ponzi scheme. You become a Myers-Briggs, seller of Myers-Briggs, you make money from it, that, folks, is what we call a Ponzi scheme. And if you're gonna use this in AI, you will come a cropper because it's hopeless. So what do we really have to do? Get out of this idea that you take bad learning theory and use AI, use the good stuff. What's the good stuff then? I would recommend, and I have no financial interest in this at all, there's a company here called Filtered, a little company based in London, who do this. They take stuff at the beginning about what you know or don't know about Excel, Word, business, blah, 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 and they use that as a basis, not only on an individual base, but an aggregated base, all the people who have taken the course, all the people in the organization who are doing the course, and they use that as the basis for delivering the Excel course so that you don't go through the linear Excel course. You might know half of it, you might know none of it. It's tailored and personalized, and you get this little grid, which is red, amber, green, about where you are, what you need to know, what you have to know, what you might know. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, beyond this, however, I think that notion of just getting data up front about who you are, let's take this to another level. Imagine I start to gather data about you as a learner as you're doing the course, and I subtly adjust the course as it goes, the more I get to know about you, that's what AI does beautifully, okay? And there's a huge amount of money in the States coming from guess who? Uh, but this is fueling the, the energy that exists across the pond in this. Uh, the idea here is absolutely to educate everyone uniquely. Every one of you are different, not in learning styles or Meyer-Briggs terms. You're different in terms of what you know, don't know, half know, need to know. So that's what this world is about. And it's about technology-enhanced teaching. That's why I call it a hybrid thing. This is about enhancing the teacher, taking the workload of a teacher, taking some of that teaching and automating it. And you have to know a lot here about the student in terms of the content, the students, dashboards, engagement, motivation. It's complicated. It's not simple. But we're getting there. OK? Uh, as I say, when you say educating everyone uniquely, it doesn't just mean get, grabbing test scores. You have to understand what's going on in the head of the learner, what misconceptions they have about the, con uh, the content, motivational factors, their metacognition background, what they're communicating out to the center. There's loads of things you could be monitoring here, and AI is grabbing all of this stuff and making inferences from it. Even your emotional state, which is interesting in terms of learning. And of course, there's the whole analytics side here. You're grabbing all of this stuff and you're taking this holistic data and really applying it back to the learner to make it work. So the old model is I get a subject matter expert, I grab that content, I interview them, I video them, and I piece it together in a fairly linear curriculum, maybe some scenario with some branching, and that's about it, with some gamification, which often disappoints me. I'm 59 years old. I don't want to be chasing rubies uh, around the screen. I don't want Pac-Man in a healthcare program. I want realism. I don't want to be patronized. The Pavlovian view of gamification drives me bananas. Uh, what we need to do is have a network where each user, in a sense, vectors through the content differently, because we're all different. And if you're teaching kids maths, you know that. Even two plus six, there's lots of ways kids can get that wrong. You have to know those ways. Teachers very rarely pick up all of them. Software can, okay? 
So if people at University of Edinburgh, ASU, just finished a massive program in American history, American history, not maths, using these techniques, okay? Biology, science programs, they're really agnostic with regard to the types of subjects you can be doing. And here's some of the data that we've got back. And these are quite large samples between 150 and 500. Student survey results, this matters. Do students like this stuff? Can, will they take this stuff? It's quite difficult to develop on the UX front. Well, just look at the blue and green things. Students, by and large, like it, okay? Would you like to have this system for other modules and courses? And this is things like law and politics. Well, yeah, the vast majority of the students would say yes to that. Uh, average success rate, and this is really interesting. Does anybody know what the dropout rate in British university system is? What percentage of students drop out in their first year in the British university system? Anybody? Sorry? 10. 10? It's 16%, okay? One in six students, one in six students drop out in their first year. Isn't that amazing? That's astonishingly high. It's even higher in the States, which is why they want kids to achieve in these 101 courses. And what we've had here with these systems is this massive increase in attainment. Okay, the average final grades go up, the dropout rates fall. It's really difficult to do both of these at the same time, but they're getting there with this type of software. It, you can see the results for yourself there. So another interesting thing about that is it really works. The better the teacher, the more, the better the system. Good teachers use the data in a very smart way and have overall higher performance. So it's not about getting rid of the teacher, it's about working with teachers and trainers. Now here's a bold statement. I saw this year what I think is the best piece of e-learning I've ever seen in my life, okay? And because it did everything, everything I've seen as worthy in e-learning, it, well, I'll show you what it is. Uh, I can't tell you the name of the client, but I got permission just to show the structure of this thing. It's called human performance intelligence. It uses artificial intelligence to do loads of things. Here's the problem. Major bank gets a billion dollar fine. Why does it get a billion dollar fine? Because the chief executive goes, I've got 200,000 people. <laughs> I cannot manage the risk across the whole of my organization. I don't know what the performance of all those people are. It's impossible for me. I'm sorry it happens. But he's got a problem. If he spends all this money, how can he reduce cost and spend more money? So it hits the bottom line of the bank. How can personnel drive greater top line growth? He's got to juggle all these things as CEO. And this is where we have to align training through AI with learning. And what this company did was they start, and I think this is absolutely right, compliance training, by and large, is a trough of horseshit. We've been delivering it for decades. What happened in 2008? Do you know what happened? Those buggers nearly took every one of us down with them because compliance training never worked. It was boring. I mean, I'm in the city all the time. That's what I do. I invest. I, you know, I raise money. Speak to any of those people who say, e-learning, ha, <laughs> they laugh at it. They laugh at it. It's a joke. Tick, 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 boom, done. How can we stop this? We have to stop this. To be fair, there are people in banks who do want to stop this. They're not all evil. <laughs> There's a few skeptics there. So we have scenario-based training, real training, where you actually do this stuff for real. Somebody comes in for a loan, you make the assessments, blah, blah, blah. We do that with a lot of people. We train the system up. And this is highly adaptive using AI techniques, adaptive learning techniques to make sure that it's properly representing what these people do, realistic scenarios. You feed that stuff through dashboards, not only to line managers, but up, again, using massively interesting data analysis and AI techniques to find out what the problems actually are. This all starts with a business problem, massively sophisticated AI-driven training, massively uh, interesting analytics that really do not only diagnose what goes wrong, but predicts what you should be doing about it and recommends actions. So this virtual loop here is no longer training, training, just training. You are actually part of a massive experiment within the organization that makes it grow and get better. You are integral to that because your organization is largely people. And the training is not only training people well, it's doing a diagnosis on the training to make sure that the business does even better. It's hugely sophisticated. Okay, fine, okay. And here we are. I won't go through the, the, the data there on that one, but let's come just finally, how much time do I have? Uh, minus a minute. 
All right, okay, very quickly. The last one here, space practice, the most ignored part, <laughs> it drives me crazy, this. I'm, 30 years I've been giving talks on space practice, nobody does a damn thing about it. So it's starting to annoy me. <laughs> However, we do have people here, you go out on the floor, look at Encore from Learning Pool, ranks are out there, Drillster, Anki, my son's doing a degree in AI. Those kids hate their lectures so much, they get three two-hour lectures on calculus a day. They come back, they're completely whacked, they use their own tools, clever algorithms that deliver space practice. They build their own little uh, card systems. They actually program this stuff themselves, write it all in HTML. <coughs> uh, QStream for salespeople, Cerego, loads of people are doing space practice and really look at this because I think it matters in your organization. We know what the problem is. We forget almost everything. You will forget everything I've just told you. That's science. How do you stop that? You take notes, you tweet, you do 101 things, but you have to be active if you're going to stick, if any of this stuff's going to stick. You take photographs, uh, that's the way you do this stuff. Because we know a lot about space practice. We can interleave what you know, half know, don't know. We can do hopping techniques, which are algorithmic techniques for distributing this practice across time. If you've got that overload, oh, I haven't done German on Duolingo for two weeks, how am I going to catch up? We've both been there. <laughs> it will spread the stuff like jam on the missing bit forward. So this is all smart maths making this stuff better, okay? And it's all delivered to mobile. Remember that umbilical cord to mobile. It's not about putting e-learning. I don't drive a car. I've been on the train from Brighton where I live to London hundreds if not thousands of times over 30 years. I've never seen anybody do an e-learning course on their mobile. <laughs> not once. You have to get out this idea that mobile is just about repurposing or responding. It'll work on everything. It'll work on the tablet and the mobile. Well, it will, but they won't use it. <laughs> <laughs> and so space practice and mobile, just let me end on this, uh, another couple of things, the economics of this. Why do algorithms matter? Well, let me show you some things where they are better than me as a teacher or a human being. First of all, they don't know I'm Scottish. They don't know I'm a man. They don't know I've got an accent, my social background. I like that because this class-ridden country we're in kills people with accents and from poor backgrounds. Work in a school, you'll see it. Free from cognitive biases, absolutely. The software doesn't know shit about cognitive biases. It never gets tired, ill, or a hangover. It does things that my brains cannot do. It personalizes, personalizes the reporting. It prevents dropout, automatically improves courses. It even spots the crap questions and writes the boat automatically. It can scale, and you can have all these enterprise-wide solutions. This is a dream boat ticket if we get this right if it can do all that. But worry here because the recent data coming out, the researchers in this front, shows that there are lots of things at risk there. Lots of middle class jobs are going to go here. If these guys are right, I personally think they are, then lots of middle management jobs are going to be replaced by technology. And that is a danger. And you can see the sort of jobs that are going to be made redundant here. They actually say, interestingly, education is the green one, and that's okay. That has a very low chance of being replaced. I don't buy it. I don't buy that. I think, the, I think already, look at librarians. We have Google. Google has destroyed hundreds of thousands of librarian jobs globally. Why are libraries closing down? Because I don't go to a library to look up anything, <laughs> ever. I did as a child, I no longer do. That's why we need less librarians. It's going to happen. It already has happened. And to end on two just really good books here. If you're interested in following up the economics here, I'll end on this note. This one's quite academic by Suskind, The Future of the Profession. It's a big section on education in it as well. It's a bit of an academic read, but a bit of a chore. Good stuff. This one's more readable called The Rise of the Robots. Both of them address this big issue about the downside, the dangers for us, our professions, in this new world. Okay, so it's a pity to end on a warning, but I think it's right to make note of the fact that there's an upside here, but there's a downside. We may have self-driving cars, but a lot of taxi drivers will lose their job. That's a sadness in a way. But we have no choice. It's going to happen. Thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Thank you.